Hello, hey, hi. In this video, I want to debrief and discuss one of my favourite topics. Camouflage. This will focus primarily on the CSRC camo competition that just took place, and as there are a lot of entries to cover, I'm going to rank all the submissions in tier list fashion. Tier list, really bro? So cringe bro, do something original, it's not 2019 mate, get with the times, what do you think of your YouTuber? Yeah, fair enough, but there's 44 entries, there's heaps to get through. The tier list is a viable method for covering a lot of things that need to be ranked, and it's also going to be fun, funny, cool and good, so yeah, whatever, moving on. To catch everyone up, recently we held a tournament for the best painted rifle in the ADF. The idea was that diggers would send in a photo of their personally painted rifle, and then through polling, they would go head to head in elimination fashion until there's only one true champion remaining. These submissions came in from Cross Army and included a multitude of different weapons, and there was a broad range of styles in terms of colour, patterns, and methods used for painting. Now, the criteria for voting was kept intentionally broad. I didn't want to shape people's voting opinion, so the language used was simply along the lines of best camo competition. But that does then beg the question. What does best mean in this context? Are we talking most effective? Are we talking which plane just looks the coolest? Well, these are fair questions. And before we get into the tier list, I'll try to explain how I personally chose to interpret best as it comes to subjectively rating camo. There is, of course, the off chance you don't care about any of that and just want to see the camo you submitted to CSRC getting dunked on. If that's the case, I'll have a timestamp below and that'll take you straight to the meat and potatoes. Yeah, boy. When we are discussing weapon camo, I think it's first helpful to identify the purpose. What exactly are we trying to achieve? Of course, in simple terms, we're spray painting a gun to blend in. But before we go nuts with the spray cans like a Western Sydney Darrow, let's explore what blending in does in more detail and how it improves our individual camouflage and concealment holistically. First of all, and perhaps one of the more undervalued aspects of weapon paint, it provides counter IR treatment, which improves your concealment when viewed under night vision. This is one huge reason why black guns are awful for concealment. Treatments like anodization and black oxide provide next to no near infrared or thermal signature management. So painting your weapon with the issued paint effectively tricks night vision by disrupting the IR reflective surface on the rifle. There's a bunch of hectic science and wizardry behind this, but how it works is less important than it just does as seen here. With modern conflict evolving the way it is, it should be no surprise how valuable this is. Night vision is simultaneously getting cheaper, more sophisticated, and more readily accessible to our adversaries, be it state actors or otherwise. Secondly, painting your rifle covers the overwhelming black colour of the EF-88. Now, we should have had 10 EF-88s. Bro, the chief of the army bro, we were meant to get 10 guns, but he personally made the black is such a gronk, bro. I know, I know. Believe me, no one was more cross than me when I found out, but that's a separate print. Well, if you're curious, I do cover this in the other EF-88 video. I'll put a link in the description. With that out of the way, black in itself is ghastly for camouflage in most terrain and vegetation types. This is due to not only the absence of black as a colour found in nature, but the contrast it creates against our camouflage uniform. More on this later. Thirdly, painting your weapon makes it more difficult for an enemy observer to discern what class or type the weapon is. Now this is not just an element of concealment, but also deception. Every young digger is taught targeting priority early in their career. You are to engage enemy leadership, signalers, machine gunners, rocket men, riflemen, in that order. This loosely ties into the same reason why we don't salute in the field. It's clearly telegraphing leadership among our own troops. The so what is as much ambiguity and uncertainty that you can create when it comes to enemy observers prior to contact, the better. A historical example of this effect is the dazzle camo patterns of World War I. These were found on British and American warships and the goal wasn't necessarily to conceal the presence of the ship itself, but to make it difficult for observers to accurately determine speed, direction and range by turning the ship from a uniform shape into a geometric mess. This also served to create difficulty in identifying the ship type being observed, which in turn creates a delay to any potential targeting. Now, admittedly, this is more beneficial from a counter observation and counter surveillance perspective, but it's a free byproduct of us painting our guns effectively, so we may as well take it. Reason number four, it serves to blend your rifle into your surroundings. Now this is speaking specifically to the color scheme and it's pretty intuitive. Match the colorway of your rifle paint job to the operating environment you are likely to be training or fighting in. Tans and beige for the desert, light greens and browns for the scrub or generic Aussie bush, and dark greens for the jungle. And finally, but I would argue most importantly, it blends the weapon to you. This is one aspect of weapon painting I think is massively undervalued, and also a common area where diggers go awry when they are painting their guns and their kit. Now, I'll confess, I haven't always stuck to this either. What is that? Over the years I've had guns painted in multicam, blade grass, camo net, digital pixel stencils, all sorts. 
but if I sit back with the benefit of hindsight and analyze the past paint jobs I've done myself, and then honestly analyze camouflage with what I know now, I keep coming back to this one guiding principle. The best possible weapon paint job is the one that most accurately mimics your existing camouflage uniform or kit. Now, bizarrely enough, I know that's probably controversial to some, and it might even seem like it's contradicting one of my earlier points, but hear me out. My argument is this. If you're an Australian, you should be trying really hard to mimic AMCU as best as possible when you are painting your rifle. Conversely, if you're Marines, you should be trying to mimic Marpat Desert and so on. And to be clear, I'm referring here to both the colorway and the pattern. I put forward that as close as possible that you can match these to your issue nice. uniform is the most effective way that you can camouflage your weapon. Oh, whatever you dog, you're just a hater, mate. You don't want the dick to use Scrimhead as a stencil because you just don't like it, mate. Scrimhead's f***ing sick, I think it's Yes, that is true. I do in fact have a personal disdain for the Scrimnet or laundry bag stencil, but from an effectiveness standpoint, I view it as an incoherent pattern in attempting to blend a rifle into either natural vegetation, terrain, or your own uniform. Getting back to the main point, painting your weapon to match your uniform is just common sense. When you're in the field, if you think about it, where is your rifle 90% of the time? At the patrol position. And if we're talking pure concealment, then this is the phase of the operation where you are presumably still undetected, either in the process of advancing to contact or conducting a recce task. Why would we not try and blend our rifle to us where it's spending most of its time in the field and where it's also located during key moments where we actually want to remain undetected? That again is patrolling. Now, don't get me wrong. And as I alluded to earlier, painting your guns grass khaki or jungle green with an appropriate and matching stencil will still make for a reasonably effective camouflage. But the reality is we're not trying to conceal the gun when it's on the ground next to you while you're having a brew. If you do decide to paint your rifle in deep greens or bright tans, you may be effectively camouflaging the gun in and of itself to the environment around you, but to the detriment of your overall concealment due to the contrast it creates when held against your body. So that's about it in terms of what I think the gold standard is for painting your gun. Try as practically as possible to match both the colours and stencil to whatever the most consistent pattern of your uniform and kit will be. With all that being said, when it comes to judging other people's submissions into the camo tournament, I'll be going off the following scoring metric I call the trinity of camo. First of all, is the pattern coherent? What do I mean by this? Mostly does it have some sort of uniformity in the shapes, the method, or the stencils used in order to achieve a cohesive and consistent scheme, or a pattern? Secondly, are the colors appropriate? Now, noting what was said about matching to the uniform, I'm going to overlook that here and judge the colors unto themselves. Are they appropriately mixed? Do they match the intended theme? and will they blend with the intended environment? Number three, and the final and most important criteria, does it look sick? Self-explanatory. Now, I'm not going to be super strict with these rules, and they're all open-ended enough that they leave me a bit of flexibility, which is important considering what constitutes looking sick is an utterly personal opinion. But that's great because it's going to suit my totally biased and subjective judging style. Without further ado, let's boogie on over to the tier list and start ranking our contestants. Righto, rap bags, no more pussyfooting about. Let's get straight into it. So the way these tier lists work, we have from S all the way down to E, E being the worst and S tier being the best. Nice. We're going to kick it off straight away with the E tier and then work our way up all the way to S tier. Now this first group of submissions are going to be E tier. That means the awful, ghastly, truly dog shit in every way. There'll be a mix of bad colors, bad patterns, usually neither effective from a camouflage perspective and also not effective from an aesthetic or simply looking cool perspective. Truly cursed, awful, terrible camouflage. Now first up is going to be Jungle Fade. This one was one of the first LMG entries that came through, so it's exciting to see something other than a style. The colors, I mean, either one of them by itself might be good. We've got the jungle green, then we've got the khaki brown, but together they just don't make sense. And the stencil, I don't know what's going on with that at all. E tier. Next up, we have the appropriately named Poo Gun by Name and Nature. Look, I think when a digger submits a gun to the competition, this was their naming convention, by the way, as the Poo Gun, probably didn't go into it with most optimistic of hopes. Another little funny detail here that you can tell the level of effort someone will put into their paint job by how they tape the gun. And you can see there's been a bit of a shit effort made here at uh, covering up the serial numbers in the mag well and some other areas. There is also this one incoherent spray direction where it's all going diagonal in 
one way and then suddenly just randomly psh, let's spray the other way. Poo gun. Not good. Bad paint. Bad stencil. Poo. E tier. The trouble with Touch of Frost, there's some genius going on here. There's some stuff that looks okay. There's been a Cryptex stencil used. Doesn't look too shabby. But the colorway makes zero sense and undoes any cohesion that came from the Cryptex stencil. We've got this dark green jungle base and then like a desert tan stripe series on these diagonal sequences. It just makes zero sense. For these poorly mixed colors alone, E tier. Ah! Smoke green demonstrates a problem that appears a few times in the tier list with a few of the different entries. And that is the concept of less is more. When it comes to smoke green, you can see this base color this, well, smoke green in itself would be reasonably effective. But then we get the other spray cans, we get this weird Kmart green, then we get this weird maroon and we want to start doing some stripes and we can't stop ourselves. And before we know it, we've just covered the whole thing with these weird nonsensical, non-flowing directional stripes and we ruin it all. This is one of those cases, it would have just been better left as the base paint in itself. E. Please leaf. Please leaf. Please leaf. It's it's fun. It's fun and funny. I get it. Please leaf. Please leaf. Because there's a leaf stencil being used. When I first saw this, I thought it was one of the rare elusive tan EF88s. This is similar to the previous entry in that the base color alone looks reasonably effective, but then there's just a haphazard stencil and camo job done over the top. We've got too light of a tan here not enough of the leaf pattern. If you'd gone harder in the paint using the leaf stencil, I think it would have vastly improved this. At the moment, it just looks like a dusty EF-88 that came out of the factory in tan. <laughs> Next up is Muk Snakeskin, or MC Snakeskin. Common sense would tell me it's meant to be MC Multicam Snakeskin, but it bears zero resemblance to Multicam, so I can only assume it's meant to be an Irish. Anyway, MC Snakeskin, it's got snakeskin. I hate snake skin. As you can see here, the pattern looks odd. It doesn't blend with anything in nature. There's not much in the way of trees, animals, or things that will blend into either the bush or maybe urban terrain if you want to hide in front of a chain link fence that's shaped like crisscrossed concentric lines. The paint job on the GLA here, that's the grenade launcher, that looks decent. It looks like a different stencil compared to what's been done on the rest of the gun. Snake skin, yuck, gross, colors not good either. Please get it out of my face. <laughs> to close out ET and most of the awful and generally horrible entries in this list is, in my opinion, the worst painted gun I've seen, not just in the camo tournament, but maybe ever, and that is Splatter. Where to begin? Splatter uses snakeskin stencil for one. It's pretty clear how I feel about that by now. Even outside of the snakeskin camo, we've got what looks like white tan, and then there's this diarrhea-esque fleck who smeared spray pattern where it looks like the paint has been leaked on it i can't even tell if that was intentional or an accident combined with the colors up around the receiver here there's some dark brown some maroon but the rest of it is just way too bright it looks like a district 9 prawn killing gun not something that's useful for blending into either amcu or the bush whatsoever absolutely diabolical extraordinarily bad to the dig who sent me this i love that you put yourself out there and please don't hate me forever but just don't pick up the spray can again ever again please thank you you're ugly now moving on to d tier in d tier we can see that there's been attempts made but there's just either something with the pattern or the color that is fundamentally flawed in both d and c tier there's also i will admit a quality of the photo that plays a factor if it is difficult to easily discern the patterns or colors, then it's not going to necessarily get a fair rating. I acknowledge that, but anyway, moving on. First up in DT, we have Green Bean. Green Bean is a perfect example of what I just mentioned. I just can't tell what's going on. The photo is potato quality. There's some decent colors used. I'll give Dig some credit for using a Knight's Armament vertical foregrip, but I just can't tell what's going on. Sorry, D. Next up is Boomer. First of all, I'm going to credit this dig for being the only one to send in a painted standalone grenade launcher. But outside of that, the paint job needs a little bit of love. We've got the gray green undercoat by the look of it, and then some of the rusty brown over the top. I know that rusty brown is one of the issued colors, but to me, it's just a weird tone of brown to be used as a base layer. It's much better suited as just a top either stencil in small doses color and not much else. D tier. The stabbing is another example of one of those guns that could have an excellent paint job. I just can't tell. So combination here of the weird angle of the photo and then the midday lighting kind of doesn't do it justice. It looks like there's some decent stencil work in there and it looks like the color tones might even be workable. But just because of the angle and mostly the shading of the photo, I can't give it a higher rating. Soz. D tier. 
Weirdly enough, this sandy jungle example, there were like three or four entries that looked very, very similar. And conceptually, there's some good stuff done here, starting with a base layer of light, which is something you always want to do because it's easier to work from light to dark than it is to work from dark to light when you're painting anything. There's also this weird Cadbury top deck thing going on where the buttstock and the rear end is really tan, really bright. And then the barrel and the grenade launcher are this darker shade of the more coyote brown color. That weird two-tone shade where it's half tan and then half brown and green is what I'm giving this a low rating for. D tier. I won't lie, Snakeskin Supreme got into DT above ET by the skin of its dick hole. So it uses Snakeskin for starters. But in this case, I think Snakeskin is what actually makes it workable. If this Snakeskin pattern had just been left with the light green undercoat and then the dark green over the top, it would have probably been reasonably effective and looked sick. But we can see in this example, once he did the Snakeskin on the bottom, he couldn't resist picking up that Coyote spray can and then doing this line of brown that looks like a poo came crash landing in and smeared itself from the ejection port down to the bottom of the buttstock DT. Despite the naming convention, Modern Woodland shares more in common with Multicam, insofar as the pattern at least. With that being said, it's a reasonably serviceable pattern and it's applied consistently across the gun. The biggest downside to Modern Woodland is that it is simply too dark DT. Similar to Modern Woodland, I would say Ella's biggest downside is that it looks too dark. Additionally, it's got that very dark undercoat of the dark green and then the rusty brown again, but then it has the diagonal stripes of desert tan, which doesn't make sense as far as the color scheme goes. With that being said, Ella's saving grace is that there's at least some consistency to the pattern. He stuck with the diagonal stripes and did it uniformly across the length of the gun. DT. I'll say for this one, at least he committed to the cause. Digger knew what he wanted, he believed in those fishnets and he followed through. The multi-layered fishnets, it looks reasonably cool. I'd say the colors is what detracts from it having a higher score in terms of sickness factor. With that being said, the end result of fishnet, it kind of makes it look like one of those old magic eye books where you have to stare at it cross-eyed until you get a headache and then a fucking puppy dog pops out of the pages or some shit. It's this weird optical illusion effect and I don't know if I like that. D -tier. The reason that High Ranger scores highly is that there's clearly been some good attention to detail placed into the stencil work. With that being said, the colors are not really cohesive. We've started with the tan base coat, which is great. But then again, this rust colored brown has made an appearance, which just isn't doing anyone any favors. Additionally, the photo quality is dog poo, very bad potato quality photo, which makes it hard to give it a fair assessment. I will give it a shout out for having a little Playboy bunny ears or a pineapple here. I'm not sure if that's intentional, but very cool, very fun. DT. Swampy, 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 swampy. Much like the High Ranger, Swampy scores highly for having a reasonably good amount of attention to detail placed into the stencil work. The biggest trouble here is I can't tell if it's the flash on the camera or if it's some sort of Instagram filter my boomer brain can't comprehend, but it's just too bright. Because of this brightness and the lighting, it's hard to tell what exactly is going on with the colorway and therefore it's hard to rate it any higher. DT. From here, we move on to CT. Within CT, we have some workable solutions. There's decent amounts of attention to detail. However, usually the color mix is potentially still not quite right, or the stencils have not been applied to their full potential. Some of these entries in CT are likely excellent camos, but much like in DT, some of these have been let down by poo poo photo quality. Whipgrass is a good example of a stencil in grass that I think looks sick but realistically isn't that effective. The colorway here on Whipgrass isn't too bad either, starting with a light tan and suitable green, not that dark green, but then we have that horrible rust colored brown over the top. Overall, it's really not too shabby. C tier. I really, really like what's going on underneath Tiger Stripe here. You can see the stencil has really been applied accurately and that the base layer colors are reasonably effective. It really was on the verge of greatness. We were this close. What's really let Tiger Stripe down is these vertical brown rust colored stripes which seem to just ruin both the pattern and the colorway underneath C tier. Grass Taipan is another example of a serviceable stencil using the grass pattern. What's more interesting with this entry, however, is that this was a stolen submission. Shortly after this one was posted to Instagram, I had a DM from someone alleging that this was their weapon and that this was a stolen submitted photo. Sure enough, they managed to provide a bunch of other evidence that demonstrated it was in fact their gun and we never figured out who the thief was 
was. It probably did not help that I had completely lost track of who had sent me what. Ah, uh, a lesson learnt for next time. So overall, less interesting than the camo is the story behind this one. CT. Woodland Whisper was definitely one of the more decked out EF88s in the tournament. And despite having that awful rust brown colour, the pattern itself is somewhat consistent. At least insofar as the stripes have been applied in the same direction. There's also a little bit of snakeskin applied, but it looks more like it was done as an afterthought or as a top layer. This one also gets brownie points for being suppressed. It's just the more gentlemanly way to shoot your gun. CT. Long Grass Hall Pass. I'm not sure what the go was with the name. This example is to what I was referring to earlier with some of the previous entries. I would say that where this paint job was stopped is where that many others would have had the temptation to keep going and then give it another few stripes with that rust brown or cover it in snakeskin. You can see here that long grass resisted that temptation and simply kept it this simple two-tone green and tan which makes it reasonably effective and looks reasonably sick. The suppressor helps. C tier. Green Gas is a super frustrating entry, mostly just because I feel with a better quality photo and a better angle, better lighting, it would be substantially more competitive. From what I can see, it looks like not only an effective, but cool looking multicam stencil. The trouble is, because of the shadow, I just can't tell. I can't see shit. It looks cool, I wish I could give it more, but cannot. C2. Noisy Cricket, I feel, is an excellent example of a specific desert or arid style paint job. You can see that while it has the snakeskin stencil, it's been applied sparingly. Also, the colours are matching and cohesive for the theme that it was trying to go for. Noisy Cricket is like a good example version of some of those previous entries that had less optimally applied both snakeskin and colourways. C tier. Of the various camouflage stencils that were used across the different entries, nothing else rustles jimmies the way this pattern does. People really don't like Cryptic. My personal thoughts are, is it the most effective pattern? Probably not. Does it look cool? To me, yes, I think it does look cool. Other people might disagree. With that being said, I think one of the reasons why Cryptek is so popular in the ADF is that it's a very simple stencil to apply. Compared to Multicam, which takes a lot more layering and different cuts of stencil, you can have one Cryptek stencil that does a reasonably effective job of giving you a consistent pattern. The result being, with a Cryptek stencil and a decent selection of colors, you can make a pretty good gun paint job. In this example here for Cryptek Dark, I can't really tell because there's a giant shadow going across half the weapon, but you can tell there's been a reasonable amount of attention to detail in applying the stencil. C2. Shoalwater Brown Snake is an unfortunate entry because it looks like a really good paint job that's been let down by two external factors. One being the lighting and shadow conditions, and secondly that it's not assembled and it's still taped up. It's using another grass stencil, which again I think looks sick, but the difference with Shoalwater Brown Snake compared to some of the previous competitors is that it has resisted the urge to go crazy with extra stencils or extra colours on top. I can't emphasise it enough, and even if I've said it before this video, painting your gun is an exercise in restraint. You have to know when to stop. C tier. Default digger marks where we're starting to get into some really elaborate stencil work. In this case, you can see that he's gone for a multicam style pattern. Now, as I alluded to earlier in the video, this is generally something I would endorse because it's going to match your uniform more effectively. However, while the pattern work is quite good, the colors simply don't match. We can see the return of the horrible rust red, which in this example undoes the colorway done with those other tans and the light greens. C tier. Nani? And to close out C tier, we have what I think is going to be a controversial entry, not because of how it looks, but because of how it performed in the tournament. And that is going to be the Muddy One. For the folks following along at home who didn't see the tournament unfold, Muddy placed third overall. To be perfectly honest, I don't think Muddy is a terrific weapon paint job. Conversely, I don't think it's a terrible paint job either. Muddy is clearly not a freshly painted rifle. It's got some wear and tear, it's got some character, it's got some fade. It looks like there's a little bit of digital pixel stencil on the buttstock, but I can't tell if that's just how it faded. Part of me suspects that Muddy scored highly because people thought it was literally mud on the gun for some reason. Either way, I simply can't tell if it's good, I can't tell if it's bad. It once was freshly painted, however in the state of the photo it's not. CT. In B tier, we really start upping our game. B tier sees very good colour or stencil application, only lets down by slight lapses in colour matching or stencil work. 
The Kaltana Special scores highly for having a simple colour scheme in that it appears it's only got the tan and the dark brown as the two colours. Additionally, it is using a Cryptex stencil, but one that has been very carefully applied. The Kaltana Special is primarily let down simply by the quality of the photo. B tier. I love old Greg for the meme value to the naming convention. I'm old Greg, pleased to meet you. And I was honestly a bit surprised it didn't perform better just because of the name alone. Old Greg presents a nicely painted SR25. This is another entry that fits a more specific niche, being a more arid camouflage setting. And while the colours are well suited for that purpose, Old Greg is mainly detracted by a little bit of the inaccurate stencil work. BT. The Speedgrass Shooter is really just an improved version of both Whip Grass and Shoalwater Brown Snake from the previous tiers below. As we can see, it's using the grass stencil again, but has been more carefully applied and with a better spread of the colors to be uniform across the whole rifle. B tier. Now while Dragon Skin may have a very dark color which I've been slamming some of the other entries for, Dragon Skin scores highly for the attention to detail and the handiwork that went into crafting this stencil. It's primarily let down by the blend of the colors. Again the dark green and that very bright tan don't really go together. However the way this stencil has been applied is nothing short of art and I would love to see Dragon Skin redone with this exact same stencil and method but with differing colors. BT. Although Parade Special doesn't have the best of photos to represent itself, what I like about it, it appears to do a decent job of replicating multicam tropic, even managing to make that rust maroon brown work to its advantage by acting as a mid layer coat. For multicam tropic vibes alone, beat it. MAF Multicam has some excellent stencil work done and there's some really good attention to detail in applying the pattern. Its primary detraction from a colorway point of view is simply too much use of that rusty maroon red. On the flip side, however, that gives it a striking resemblance to the MAF DPCU camouflage of the mid 90s. This was an extremely rare version of DPCU and was intended to service as the OP4 camouflage uniform for training exercises within Australia. As a side note, MAF cam in its original uniforms is exceedingly rare these days. So if you happen to spot any in an OP shop somewhere, Make sure you scoop it up. BT. I'll confess that Cryptek Desert gets some brownie points for its setup alone. Cryptek Desert does what some of the previous Cryptek entries failed to do and starts with a tan base coat before gradually working to darker tones on top. It manages to do this without using too much of that awful rust brown, thereby creating a reasonably serviceable arid or desert pattern. For the process and the layering of the colors, BT. Speegrass, not to be confused with the Speegrass Shooter, is by far the highest ranking grass stencil weapon on the list. Much like some of the other B-tier entries, Speegrass simply takes the concept that was executed in the tiers below and does it to a higher standard. On Speegrass, we can see effective use of both appropriate and matching colours, and also a cohesive application of the stencil consistent across the whole gun. This creates a camouflage pattern that looks to be not only reasonably effective in the drier months of North Queensland, but also looks pretty sick. B-tier. Moving into A tier, where the entries are excellent all around. Here we can see keen-eyed application of both pattern and colours with autistic attention to detail. All these entries are likely very effective from a camouflage perspective, or at the very least, look extremely cool. Splinter combines both excellent use of stencil work with appropriate and suitable colours to create an overall very well done weapon paint job. I might be wrong, but it appears that Splinter has also used camo net as its pattern which is a super underrated stencil. Additionally, Splinter has kept it simple with the color choices, and we can see that it started with a tan base before then adding the light brown and the light green, as opposed to the heavily contrasting dark green or dark brown. In this way, we can see it's combined what is an effective stencil with a simple three color choice, that makes sense. A tier. Jungle Gun seems to have possibly mixed two stencils in a Cryptek cutout and also a grass stencil. With that being said, Jungle Guns has excellent application of the color scheme. Again, utilizing the light green and the light brown with no obviously contrasting colors, such as dark green clashing with light tans. Further, you can see the attention to detail that's been put into the base coats and also sparing use of the rust brown color used successfully as a mid layer coat. Overall, both excellent stencil and color application, A tier. The desert option is by far the best example of a region or terrain specific paint job. It is immediately obvious that it's going for a desert or arid camouflage scheme and as a specific region camouflage, it excels. It has achieved this by logically starting out with a tan base coat before working to a mid layer of light brown 
and then a top layer of some very sparingly applied dark stencil splotches. All of these factors combine to make this by far the best desert or arid specific camouflage paint job on the tier list. A tier. Given how I've been carrying on like a pork chop regarding Scrimnet this whole video, you might want to sit down and strap yourself in for this one. Salty Scrim looks skits. <laughs> now, before you shit the bed, Hear me out. Salty Scrim excels where some of the other previous snakeskin entries fail, and that is the owner has exercised restraint in applying any other layers or colors on top of the Scrim net stencil. Further, it's been kept minimalist with only two tone colors primarily used across the whole weapon system. By doing this, it's created not only a reasonably effective camouflage pattern, but also a Scrim net stencil cam job that looks amazing. A well-earned A tier for the salty one. In the same way that the desert option scores very highly for being a specific desert camouflage pattern, Tully Green scores highly for being, in my opinion, the best jungle or dark green camouflage pattern on the list. In this case, for a jungle focused paint job, the dark green base coat makes total sense. This has been added to with mid and top layers sparingly of the light tan and the brown colors. In keeping these top color layers minimal, it is stayed true to its original goal of being an effective jungle or dark green colored paint job. A tier. Brush stroke scores highly for the fine craftsmanship put into the detail of the paint job and also for being a decent replication of the colorway especially found in the original old school Rhodesian brush stroke pattern, which I assume this paint job is replicating. Brush strokes is one of the few paint jobs that has managed to use the rust brown as a mid and top layer coat and still come out looking sick. In attempting to recreate obscure and vintage camouflage patterns alone, A tier. It's finally time, gangsters. Our S tier champions must be revealed. It's been a long and painful journey to get to this point. We've seen it all. The good, the bad, the ugly. We've seen snakeskin, cryptic, long grass, leaf grass, big grass. Who? Long have you waited for this moment? The unveiling of the Ultimo Ombre, the big cheese, the sickest, most skits, goated in the sauce, weapon paint job, Australia wide. And your champion is. <laughs> There's two. Surprise! Let's break them down one at a time. First of all is the OG MC. OG MC is a faithful recreation of the multicam pattern. You can see the detail that has gone into creating the base layers, followed by the mid layer of the light green, and then finally the top coats of splotches of both white and the dark green. In doing so, this has created one of the most accurate recreations of multicam I've seen on an ADF weapon. Now, there are those who would scoff at this entry and say that multicam is boring, but its effectiveness as a true Truly multi spectrum pattern can't be denied. Regardless of what thoughts you have about multicam in and of itself, you have to appreciate the talent that goes into recreating such a pattern on an issued rifle such as this. For immaculate attention to detail and recreation of multicam, resulting in both an effective and extremely sick looking camo, OG MC scores S tier. Hey, that's pretty good. The final submission is Autumn Multicam. This will come as no surprise to many, as Autumn Multicam was the winner of the camo tournament, as voted by you. Much like OG MC, Autumn Multicam displays excellent attention to detail in creating a Multicam-esque stencil style. In contrast to OG MC, however, Autumn Multicam has elected to use a more unique colorway that I believe is more closely matched to AMCU camo and by proxy, the Australian bush. Autumn Multicam displays both excellent use of stencil and colors. For excellent stencil work and a unique but extremely effective color scheme, Autumn Multicam scores S tier. <laughs> the lights are coming on at the Mad Cow, my little diglets. It's time to pack it up. Let me know in the comments if you agree with the results of the list. For now, I must bid you farewell. As always, Thank you for your time.